nobody that I know of put the experience of joy profoundly analyzed together with a defense of absolute, objective, outside of me, ultimate truth together like Lewis. Nobody combines the implications of this experience of joy throughout his life with the implications of this razor-sharp, logical, philosophical side of Lewis. Nobody that I've ever read comes close. So what is the relationship between the experience of joy and objective truth? That's the question John Piper answers from the life of C.S. Lewis in this episode of Light and Truth. This talk was originally given at the Desiring God 2010 Conference for Pastors. Now, we make a turn. How did this experience of joy relate to Lewis's defense of objective, absolute truth? How did the two come together? The first thing he taught, by the way, at Oxford was philosophy. He did his first B.A. in philosophy. Then he did his second B.A. in literature. Just taught philosophy for a year, shifted over, and his imagination awoke. He almost died as a philosopher. Intellectually, mentally, imagination. But he never lost the tools of philosophy. The tools of God. What we see is that when Lewis saw the historical Christ and the eternal, objective, absolute, real God as the object of his consolable longing, he knew, intuitively, and then with reason, he knew if truth goes, if objective reality goes, if the possibility of knowing goes, joy goes. Because joy had taken him to the real. It had taken him to objective, absolute source. The original shout, it's there. All this was echo. If that goes, this is infinitely trivialized. Christ was real. God was real. Truth was real. Here's the way he put the connection. Quote, There was no doubt that joy was a desire. But a desire is turned not to itself, but to its object. The form of the desired is in the desire. It is the object which makes the desire harsh or sweet, coarse or choice, high or low. It is the object that makes the desire itself desirable or hateful. I have been wrong in supposing that I desired joy itself. Joy itself, considered simply as an event in my own mind, turned out to be of no value at all. All the value lay in that of which joy was the desiring. And that object, quite clearly, was no state of my own mind or body at all. Now here you see the absolutely crucial link for him between truth and joy. Quote, joy itself, considered simply as an event in my own mind, turned out to be of no value at all. All the value laid in that of which joy was the Desiring, So you see what is at stake for Lewis in the question of truth. The entire modern world, as he saw it, was moving away from what he was discovering. Namely, that objective, absolute, external, outside of me, reality slash truth with a capital T, exists. And everything hangs on it that's worth living for. And now we live, what, he died the same day as John Kennedy. And we live in a sea 
of postmodern relativism that he could smell and hate it with all his might. He wrote what Alan Jacobs calls his most significant critique of culture, a little book called The Abolition of Man. Significant title. He takes on a high school textbook. It might be a junior high, it doesn't say. A secondary school textbook. In an imaginary way, but he said, I have these books on my shelf. I'm not making this up. In it, he illustrates what he means by the abolition of man and by his defense of truth with this interchange. He's quoting now the authors of this horrible textbook as he assesses it that our children are reading. Quote, when the man said, this is not Lewis talking, this is the author of the textbook. When the man said, that is sublime, he was talking about a waterfall. That is sublime. He appeared to be making a remark about the waterfall. Actually, he was not making a remark about the waterfall, but a remark about his own feelings. What he was saying was, really, I have feelings that I associate in my mind with the word sublime. Or shortly, I have sublime feelings. This confusion is continually present in language as we use it. We appear to be saying something very important about something real. And actually, we are only saying something about our own feelings. End quote from The Abolition of Man. Lewis says, the schoolboy who reads this text will believe two propositions. Firstly, that all sentences containing a predicate of value are statements about the emotional state of the speaker. And two, all such statements are unimportant. That, Lewis says, is the abolition of man. And it's the abolition of man, and it is. He's right. It's the abolition of man in more senses than one. Not only will everything true and beautiful and great be trivialized, just a snip, synapse is going off in your brain, that's all it is. When you say you're a beautiful wife or you're a faithful son or this is a magnificent day or God is faithful or God is holy, they're just comments about what's going on. In here, and everything is absolutely trivialized, and man, for all that man is worth, is destroyed by this epistemology. And so many of you are infected with it. Secondly, there's no resistance to tyrants anymore. Might makes right. If he says he's the best for the country, and he'll use force to prove it, what have you got to say except to add your synapses to his synapses? And so much for that debate. Everything is trivialized, and in the end, Lewis says, civilization is over. It will be over. So the abolition of man was his powerful defense of absolute truth. In the end... It wasn't so much for Lewis, I think, emotionally and immediately that civilization is being undone and that all is being trivialized, but that my discovery of joy is over. Joy is over. This universal, powerful, massive experience of an inconsolable longing pointing to something real out there, namely God, is nothing if truth is not real, if God is not real, if there's no objective reality outside of me. So Lewis' fight for truth was a fight for joy. We could take a long time here and ask the question that Sam has been asking 
about how that relates to the glory of God. And since he gave all those quotes that he got first dibs on, I will pass over them except to underline one sentence that was on the screen this morning. Here it is. This is, this is C.S. Lewis, not Jonathan Edwards. The Scotch Catechism says that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But we shall then know that these are the same thing. Quote, fully to enjoy is to glorify. In commanding us to glorify, God is inviting us to enjoy him Close quote. I don't think Lewis ever read Jonathan Edwards. If he had, he would not have liked him. And the reason I say that is because he said that George MacDonald was the teacher he considered most close to the spirit of Jesus and had not written a page where he fancied MacDonald had not influenced him. And I know that MacDonald abominates Jonathan Edwards. This is not easy for me. To have two, the two dead people that have influenced me most outside the Bible, C.S. Lewis and Jonathan Edwards, would not have liked each other. In fact, might have despised each other. This is not easy. But so it is. The means by which God brought Lewis to himself, namely, the inconsolable longing that was delightful to have, called joy, turns out to be the goal of his Christian life, namely the glory of God. Because by delighting in God, God is, is glorified. Now, why, in summary, am I still so helped by Lewis when he has made so many mistakes. And my answer is that nobody that I know of put the experience of joy profoundly analyzed together with a defense of absolute, objective, outside of me, ultimate truth together like Lewis. Nobody combines the implications of this experience of joy throughout his life with the implications of this razor-sharp, logical, philosophical side of Lewis. Nobody that I've ever read comes close. So what I want to do is to give you practical implications of this combination that have walloped me, shaped me, made me. I met Lewis as a freshman in college in mere Christianity and then began to read. I've read almost everything he's written outside the, the book he called the O'Hell book um, because that's the initials, Oxford History of English Language, O-H-E-L. I've never read that one, although I've got a quote from it here because it's so good. But I've read more of Lewis than any biography I've given in the last 22 years, with the possible exception of Edwards. So he's been with me a long time, and I do not cease to be helped. Why? So I've given you the core why, experience of joy, profoundly analyzed and the experience of defending truth, absolute, objective, outside of me, meeting together in a way I don't know any other author does. Number one, Lewis' pursuit of joy by means of rational defenses of the truth had a liberating effect on me from false dichotomies. He demonstrated for me and convinced me that rigorous, precise, penetrating logic is not inimical to deep, soul-stirring feeling. 
vivid, lively imagination. He was a romantic rationalist. That's one of the little books I read 40 years ago. I couldn't find it in print anywhere. It's this little paperback called Lewis, Romantic Rationalist. He combined what almost everybody today assumes are mutually exclusive. Rationalism and poetry. Cool logic, warm feelings. Disciplined prose, free imagination. And in shattering these old stereotypes for me, he freed me to think hard and write poetry, argue for the resurrection and compose a hymn to Christ, smash an argument and hug a friend, demand a definition and use a metaphor. It's a wonderful thing when a great man shows a struggler how to be himself. Number two. Liberation from chronological snobbery. Lewis' unwavering commitment to what is true and real and valuable as opposed to what is trendy and fashionable and current has been another kind of liberation for me for which I will thank God to the end of my days. He loved the wisdom of the ages. He lived outside his century. He didn't care about the whimsy of passing present. He called himself in his first inaugural lecture at Cambridge. After 30 years at Oxford, went to Cambridge, and his first lecture, he called himself a Neanderthaler and a dinosaur. And he said, if you can't be persuaded by me as an arguer, consider me a specimen (laughs) from the Middle Ages. And he was. I wish his tribe had not died out. I wish the dinosaurs had not become extinct. I hope, I hope they live again. He didn't read newspapers. He never wore a watch. He never learned to type. Never owned a car or drove one except once. Cared nothing about good appearances. He wore the same old clothes till they were threadbare. He was incredibly free from the addicting powers of the present moment. And the effect on me was just huge. It made me wary of what he called chronological snobbery. Something is good because it's new. There is no correlation between newness and goodness. Duh. There's just no correlation between oldness and goodness or newness and goodness. It's irrelevant to when something is good and beautiful and true and valuable. Time has nothing to do with it. Truth and beauty and goodness are not determined by when they exist. Nothing is inferior for being old. Nothing is valuable for being new. This has freed me from the tyranny of novelty and opened for me the wisdom of the centuries. And I thank God for C.S. Lewis. Number three. Lewis keen, penetrating sense of his own heart's ache for joy combined with his utter amazement at the sheer objective realness of things other than himself has over and over awakened me from the slumbers of self-absorption to see and to savor the world and the maker of the world. And this is slopped over onto doctrine and the gospel. When I read Lewis' experience of the world and how awake he is to reality that I just ignore and I'm awakened again to see the world the way he sees it, I see Christ more clearly. I read my Bible with new eyes. This is what I thank him for. Lewis gave me and continues to give me an intense sense of the astonishing realness of things. 
He had the ability to see and to feel what most of us see and don't see. He had what Alan Jacobs called omnivorous attentiveness. I love that phrase. Omnivorous attentiveness. Oh, just take that away and, and, and pay double for your conference registration. Just, I, just, I just gave that to you. No added expense at all. Change your life. Omnivorous attentiveness. Now I hope you feel what I'm talking about. I love that phrase. What this has done for me is hard to communicate. To wake up in the morning and be aware of the firmness of the mattress, the warmth of the sun's rays, the sound of the clock ticking or my wife's breathing machine, the coldness of the wooden floor, the wetness of the water in the sink, the sheer being of things. What Lewis called quiddity, Latin for whatness, W-H-A-T-N-E-S-S, the whatness of reality. It's just there. I mean, there didn't have to be water. Imagine a world in which there's no water, and one day somebody says, I guess I want to show you. Look, you would just, you would fall down. You would... It's amazing. But you never say that. Lewis does. He gets me going in such a way that when I walk to the 6.30 prayer meeting, across the bridge, I have the little child feeling as the sun's coming up, he did it again. They got that from Chesterton. You should say that every morning. He did it again. The sun came up. Look at that. That's 93 million miles away. Holding us in place. Making us perfectly warm. Even here. This is okay. <laughs> We're not dead. He helped me to become alive to life. To look at the sunrise. He helped me to see what is there in the world. Things that if we didn't have them, we would pay a million dollars to get them and having them ignore. Your eyes, your fingers. He convicts me of my callous inability to enjoy God's daily gifts. He helps me to awaken my dazed soul so that the realities of life and of God and of heaven and of hell are seen and felt. I could go on and on about how this affects preaching, brothers. How this affects communication. How seeing suns and water and fingers and cold wooden floors affects the way you preach. And the living power of words. Because you've seen and felt and you bring that over onto the Bible. Pow! Suddenly reality streaming out of these pages. Because by grace, Lewis or whoever has waked you up from the slumbers of self-absorption. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper concludes our three-part series on the mind and the heart of C.S. Lewis with a talk titled, Lewis and the Pursuit of Joy. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.